carefully at Revelation chapter 1, and you take note of all the characteristics that are set forth in chapter 1 of Revelation of Christ, that the one characteristic of Christ that is mentioned more than any other, and inspiration has told us that when the Lord repeats things, it is of great consequence. The one characteristic that's mentioned more than any other of Christ in Revelation chapter 1 is that he is the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. And if this is a new concept for you, I will tell you that we're, since we read a quote early on where Sister White says all the books of the Bible meet and end in the book of Revelation, and those theologians that really dissect the word of God will tell us that two out of three words that are in the book of Revelation find their beginnings in the Old Testament. So if we're going to understand what it means that Christ is the first and the last in Revelation chapter 1, we'll no doubt find it in the Old Testament. And if you start in Isaiah 40 and read to the end of Isaiah 40, you will see that over and over again, Christ is portrayed as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the last, the beginning and the ending, the first and the last. And you will be putting together the definition of what that means in chapter 1 of Revelation. And it means many things, but basically what we're going to focus on here is that Christ is the God that portrays the end from the beginning. And, of course, chapter 1 of Revelation is the purposeful foundation for any student of prophecy intelligently understanding the book of Revelation. So we're going to take that um, point of reference and continue on looking at Islam, which we've all set forth as the fulfillment of the 56th trumpet. I would like to, even though you may know this is from the presentations, I at least want to put it into your mind specifically. When we're talking about Islam being a subject of Bible prophecy, this isn't new life. Islam as a subject of Bible prophecy has already been identified by the pioneers of Adventism and it has been directly endorsed at least nine times by Ellen White, which she has put into the record here. And she endorses the messages that were proclaimed from 1840 to 44 um, six times. And when she endorses both of these charts, eight, that makes it eight, and then with her endorsement of Josiah Lynch's prediction in great controversy, that's nine times where Sister White is saying what the pioneers taught on the trumpets were correct, and what they taught on the trumpets, the fifth and sixth trumpets, the first and second woe, was Islam. And therefore, for us to suggest that Islam is a subject of Bible prophecy, it isn't new life. It's an established foundational truth of Adventism. So we should not be shocked with any, that we should be willing to at least consider the subject of Islam and in my Bible prophecy. So in your notes you have Isaiah 44, 6 through 8, which says, you can turn there if you wish, or you can read it from your notes. It says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And who, as I, shall call, and shall declare it, and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people, and the things that are coming, and shall come, let them show unto them, fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it, ye are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Amen. When it comes to Christ's ability, his work, in illustrating the end from the beginning, one of the things that is, and this is associated with him being the first and the last, one of the things that he has told us that he employs in order to accomplish that work of portraying the end from the beginning is that he's appointed the ancient people. Ancient Israel illustrates modern Israel. Ancient Egypt represents modern Egypt, Revelation 11, verse 8, and of the dragon power throughout the book of Revelation. Um, ancient Babylon represents modern Babylon. These ancient people illustrate the subjects that are taken up in the book of Revelation, and one of the ancient people that is a subject of prophecy is the descendants of Abraham's firstborn, Ishmael. 
And this isn't his firstborn in the sense of an inheritor of the covenant promises. I'm not saying that. I'm just being technically correct. This is one of the descendants of Abraham, who is the father of faith. Um, one of the numbers, and I know that there are some in Adventism that really stumble over numbers, um, actually applying any significance in prophecy of numbers. I hope none of us in this room have that small of a case, but there are some in Adventism that do. And one of the numbers in uh, Bible prophecy that you can identify as symbolizing something that's very easy to see is the number 12. The 12 is connected with God's kingdom. It's 12 sons of Jacob, 12 disciples, 12 gates in the city. On the testimony of two or three things established, when you run the number 12 over and over again, you'll find that it has a relationship with God's kingdom. So as we're going to look at Ishmael, the firstborn of Abraham here, and we're going to set, suggest that Ishmael is the symbol of Islam, is the ancient people that illustrate Islam at the end of the world. You'll notice that in Genesis 17, 20, it says, And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee, behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. Not ten princes, not fourteen princes. He was going to have twelve sons. There is a symbolic connection to the kingdom of God, which which the descendants of Israel always maintained. They were the, uh, they were connected all the way through. The the land that the descendants of Israel came to control and own, Arabia, that part of the world, there is a special area. Uh, I think it's in Yemen. But it's in the Saudi Arabia um, area. It is called something spices. It's a, it's a territory called the Peninsula of Spices. That isn't it. It's something like that has to do with, with the fact of the incense that are only grown in that part of the world. And the point is this. When ancient Israel was going to run the sanctuary service, they were required to use certain <coughs> spices, incense, and the only place that you can get those incense is from that part of the world, which was controlled by the descendants of Ishmael, and therefore it was a requirement throughout Israel's history that they maintain the relationship with the descendants of Ishmael, even though the descendants of Ishmael were going to be alienated from them, be a constant thorn in their flesh, they still had to have a relationship with them. There was a connection that specifically and purposely put together by the Lord between Israel and Israel. Um, in Genesis 49, verses 1 and 28, and we don't have to be there, I'm going to tell you this story so we can move through this very quickly. This is the story where Jacob calls his 12 sons together, and he pronounces a blessing upon them, but the blessing that Jacob pronounces upon his 12 sons is not simply a blessing, it's a prophecy of the role that his sons would fulfill at the end of the world. And under those verses on your on page 111 of your notes, you'll see a quote from Patriarchs and Prophets where Sister White confirms this. She says, At last, all the sons of Jacob were gathered about his dying bed, and Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together and hear you, sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father, that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. The last days of the end of the world, right? Often and anxiously he had thought of their future and had endeavored to picture himself this story of the different tribes. Now as his children waited to receive his last blessing, the spirit of inspiration rested upon him, and before him, in prophetic vision, the future of his descendants was unfolded. One after another, the names of his sons were mentioned, the character of each was described, and the future history of the tribes was briefly foretold. What I want you to see here is that the twelve sons of Jacob, which is easiest, easy for us to say, yes, this is connected to the kingdom of God. Um, the ancient Israel that we're dealing with here had a prophecy about the role that they would play at the end of the world. And ancient Israel here is the descendants of Abraham. And we're making the case that Ishmael, the firstborn, is also the descendant of Abraham, and that he too has a prophecy in God's word that describes the role that he will play at the end of the world. And you can find this in Genesis 
16, verse 12. Speaking of Ishmael, it says, And he will be a wild man. It's worth taking note that this word that is translated wild here um, is a root word that is connected with the wild Arabian ass. In fact, sometimes when it's translated in the Bible, it's translated as ass. Okay. But donkey, donkey, ass, wild, wild Arabian ass is how it's sometimes translated. I'm making that point to let you know that right from the very start, Ishmael is associated with the horse. Okay, because when we get to Revelation chapter 9, Islam is represented by the horse. That's why Brother Jamal was making sure that he emphasized those passages in chapter 9 when he was dealing with the first and second book. And it is obvious that that is the pioneer understanding of the symbol of Islam in chapter 9, because when the pioneers came together to symbolically represent Islam on these two sacred charts, they are represented here by the horse, the war horse. Of course, when they were to correct that chart in 1850, they still represented Islam by the horse. So when it's giving us the prophecy of Israel's descendants, it says he will be a wild man, and his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brothers. Brothers and sisters, I don't know that we'll get this far along in history how we're going to deal with some things, but I'd like you to point out to you here that the United States in verse 14 of Revelation 13 forces the world to accept a one world government. It's easy to demonstrate, you may not have understood this before, but there's only one definition of the image of the beast given in inspiration, and it's the combination of church and state with the church in control of the relationship. There's only one definition of the image of the beast given in inspiration. It's the combination of church and state, church in control of the relationship. And in verse 14 of Revelation 13, the United States goes to the whole world and commands them that they should set up an image of the beast. In verse 14 of Revelation 13, by definition, it demands that the United States is telling the world that they come under the umbrella of a one world government. And this one world government is spoken of many times in Bible prophecy. This is the one world government of Revelation 17, 17, where the 10 kings, which represent the United Nations in Revelation 17, agree to give their kingdom to the beast, the papacy of the end of the world, and this one world the image of the beast, combination of church and state, with the papacy in control of the relationship. So we're not taking time to look at this in Revelation 13 and 17. It is very defendable. It is defended very well on the 2004 Prophecy School and other presentations, but my point is this. This is not just a, a random happening. There is a specific reason why this happens. And the reason that it happens is that the descendants of Ishmael, Islam, their hand is going to be against every man's hand in the world. And they are to create such a crisis as they bring on the third jihad that every man's hand in the world through the organization that we call the United Nations is to come together against them. So I want you to at least understand that this prophecy here in Genesis 16 has a specific and direct connection to end time Bible prophecy. It's not just about the fact that the descendants of Ishmael are crazy men, because they are. Right? How crazy is it to walk into a room with bombs attached to yourself and suddenly and unexpectedly blow yourself up? Okay, that's pretty extreme. But from my, from my understanding. As you look at Ishmael in sacred history, and we've touched upon this before, throughout their history in the Old Testament, New Testament, and after the biblical era in the time all the way through the Reformation, Islam, the descendants of Ishmael, in the Old Testament, called the children of the East, often and primarily, they were a double-edged sword. And what I mean by that is they fulfilled two purposes. When ancient Israel was um, disobedient, the Lord would allow the descendants of Israel to attack them, punish them, bring judgment upon them. But there are still several places in the Old Testament where it's obvious that the Lord was using 
the descendants of Israel to provide deliverance to God's people. We've mentioned some before. Take Joseph to Egypt, providing the finances and carry crops into Egypt to protect him from Herod. They're a double-edged sword all the way through history. One of the clear symbols of Islam at the end of the world is Balaam. We've mentioned this before too. You'll see a couple notes on the bottom of the page here dealing with Balaam. He was hired to curse Israel just before they went into the Promised Land in Numbers 22, which is a clear illustration of modern Israel just before they go into the real Promised Land. And Balaam there is attempting to bless or curse Israel, but all he can do is bless Israel. This is the double-edged story of Islam, and Balaam is associated with the children of the East, and the children of the East in the Old Testament is the descendants of Ishmael. He's representing, once again, at the end of the world, the role of Islam in both being a blessing and a curse. And um, this is also represented, as Jamal pointed out, in the first row of the fifth trumpet, in the warfare that Islam was bringing during the time period of Abu Bakr, as it was going out against Catholic Christianity and forcing the Catholics to become Muslims or die, they were given a command to hurt not those Christians that were Sabbath keepers. Um, they provided a protection for those Sabbath keepers during that time period, just as they provided a protection for Martin Luther and the Reformation. Um, and Martin Luther, in his writings, in the early part of his writings, called Islam the deliverer of the Reformation. He later called them the Antichrist, but nevertheless, in the beginning, he understood that providentially they were the force that was protecting the Reformation. So they, they're double-edged sword every, throughout all their history. Descendants of Ishmael have been both a blessing and a curse, as illustrated um, with Balaam. Going to the next page. In well, let's turn now. Revelation 11. As Jamal pointed out, the second woe is not, is not marked as ending until verse 14 of Revelation 11. And the reason for this, of course, is that the trumpets, and that includes the fifth and sixth trumpet, which are the first and second woe, are the providential forces that would punish or bring down Rome. The first four trumpets brought down Western Rome by 476. The fifth and sixth trumpet would bring down Eastern Rome in 1453 and bring down Papal Rome in 1798. In the second, well, the sixth trumpet, you have illustrated not simply Islam alone, but because the second trumpet, the second woe, does not end until after the French Revolution, here in verse 14 of Revelation 11, then we also see the role of atheism, which is the dragon power, and the part that they play in delivering the deadly wound to papal Rome in 1798. Therefore, one of the characteristics of the second woe is not simply Islam, but also the atheism of the French Revolution. And of course, France in Revelation 18, so Revelation 11, is one of the ten parts of the, this kingdom. The kingdom is divided into ten parts, and the kingdom in Bible prophecy is divided into ten parts to pay and Rome, and one part of that tenfold kingdom was France. It's France that suffered the first quake in Revelation 11, being the French Revolution. But that kingdom that was divided into ten parts was pagan Rome, and Sister White tells us, we read it from the Great Controversy, that it's the dragon power. Therefore, France, atheistic France, that brings the deadly wound, represents the dragon power. Therefore, when you take one and two and add them together, what do you get? Three. So when you take the characteristics of the first woe and the second woe and add them together, you get the characteristics of the third woe. So when the third woe arrives in history on September 11, 2001, you don't simply see Islam. You can see in that third woe the activities of the dragon power. This is worth knowing if you understand this message and you're going to teach it, because the one of the stumbling blocks for us Seventh-day Adventists is as soon as we say that it is Islam that fulfilled September 11, 2001, everyone in the room says, doesn't press a preacher know anything about those conspiracy DVDs that are out there that says it was the globalists that brought down the Twin Towers, and most certainly I know about those. But it was Islam that was being marked prophetically at that time, even if the globalists had some behind-the-scenes part to play 
that still fits within the characteristics of the second law. But brothers and sisters, the prophetic testimony is what we need to recognize when the third woe arrives is Islam has returned. Islam that is marking this event for us. In verse 18, now remember in verse 14 of Revelation 11, it says, The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And it's going to give us a description of some of the components of the third woe. And if you go to verse 18, in Revelation 11, it says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou should give us reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest, shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. In the first few years after 1844, perhaps Brother Duane knows, it doesn't, it's not that important, but whether it was 46, 47, 48, at some point in that history, Joseph Bates wrote an article about verse 18. And he said that all of these events, the angering of the nations, the wrath of God, the time to judge the dead, the time to give the rewards, and destroy them that destroy the earth, that they're all descriptions of the same event. They take place at the same time. Immediately thereafter, Sister White was given information, and she comes out with an article that you find in Early Writings, page 36, where she's responding to the article of Brother Bates. And it's there under Now Being Angry, and she says this. This is on page 112 of Early Writings, page 36. I saw that the anger of the nation, the wrath of God, and the time to judge the dead were separate and distinct, one following the other. Also that Michael had not stood up, and that the time of trouble, such as never was, had not yet commenced. The nations are now getting angry, but when our high priest has finished his work in the sanctuary, he will stand up, stand up, put on the garments of vengeance, and then the seven last plagues will be poured out. I saw that the four angels would hold the four winds until Jesus' work was done in the sanctuary, and then would come the seven last plagues. But I want you to see there, if you would, is the second um, event in verse 18, is the wrath of God. And the wrath of God is marking the seven last plague. The wrath of God is what takes place immediately after probation closes, when Michael stands up. Therefore, the angering of the nations comes just before the close of probation. The angering of the nations is something that is representing something that takes place prior to the close of probation. What we're suggesting, of course, is that in the first woe and the second woe, where we see the warfare of Islam, that we also see in both those histories an illustration of the sealing time. And we're suggesting that the angering of the nations of verse 18 is illustrating the role of Islam during the sealing time of the 144,000. We are suggesting that Islam is the power that angers the nations. And that this takes place during the sealing time of the 144,000. Whatever the angering nation of the nations is, as Seventh-day Adventists, it should be easy for us to understand that the sealing of the 144,000 takes place in the time period of the angering of the nations, because based upon verse 18, as soon as the angering of the nations concludes, probation closes, so we know the sealing time of the 144,000 concludes just before probation closes, correct? So whatever the angering of the nations is, it's an event that takes place during the sealing time. And the sealing time, another way to express this in Adventist terminology, is this is the time period of the judgment of the living. Right? You know, the judgment begins with the dead, and at some point it moves to the living. Yes and no. I would point you to the 2004 Prophets of Sea School. For the record, the question is, is there a difference between the ceiling time of the 144,000 and the ceiling time for those that come out of Babylon? It's all the ceiling time, um, but it's the ceiling time is an expression that takes place in conjunction with the work of Christ in the most holy place. So it's, it's corresponding with his judgment, and his judgment is progressive 
and we've been told that judgment begins with the house of God. So the sealing of the house of God takes place first, and then it moves to those outside of Adventism. And you can mark the change at the Sunday law. Because at the Sunday law, the, you know that the judgment of the God's people is concluded. If we come to the Sunday law, uh, we come to the great crisis that Sister White speaks about. The character is never developed in the crisis. It's only demonstrated. Adventists have to have formed the character for the seal of God prior to the Sunday law. And we read a quote here today where she says, The time of destructive judgments is a time of mercy for those who have never known the truth. That the Sunday law, national apostasy is followed by national ruin. Judgment for Adventism has finished. And in that cataclysmic time of national ruin and the personation of Christ by Satan, the 11th hour workers um, will be judged by any of us. Um, so we're su suggesting that this is the time period of the fourth angel's message, right before probation closes, and in agreement with the return of the lines that we dealt with earlier on, we'll see Daniel 9, 25 there, um, where the work of Nehemiah, which was the fourth way mark in the history of the three decrees, that work was done even in troublous times. The streets and the walls would be built in troublous times. The fourth angel's message of Revelation 18 is parallel to that history and the troublous times that take place during the latter reign um, history is parallel in the troublous times of Nehemiah. Um, in Luke 21, which uh, I think Brother Jamal gets to do, Luke 21 is a very fun presentation to do this one. I'm aware of that. If you go to here, I'm I don't get to do that. If you go to verse 25 of Luke 21, Brother Jamal is going to point out to you that these signs in Luke 21 that the disciples had asked Christ for, that they are sequential, all right? They're going to go in order. Um, if you haven't seen them in order, they are in order. In, in verse 25 of Luke 21, um, it says, dealing, just cutting into one part of the signs, it says, and there shall be signs in the sun and the moon. Um, when was that? When was the dark day? 1780, right? So that's that's a historical event. And in the stars, when was that? 1833. And upon the earth, distress of nations. And the distress of nations that took place in that time period of the Millerite history was the distress of nations that was being accomplished by Islam in connection with the fulfillment of the time prophecy of Revelation 9.15, identifying how long the Ottoman Empire would bring warfare against the armies of Rome. And the time for that warfare to be carried out was to conclude on August 11, 1840. But, brothers and sisters, the Ottoman Empire at that time period, the power of Turkey, um, was at that point called the weak man of the East. It no longer had the, the power that it had in, it, in the height of its glory. It was pretty much powerless. But there was a, another Islamic power in the world that wanted to continue on in the Jihad, and that power was Egypt. And Egypt, in order to, to establish itself as the premier um, nation that was holding the banner of Islam, it determined that what it needed to do to carry on the, the jihad was to attack Turkey and take the mantle of Islamic uh, power from Turkey, and it did so. It started a war with Turkey, it captured its navy, and it brought its navy back to Egypt, and it was going to keep its navy, and the European powers looked at this situation in the eight, early, late 19, 1830s, leading up to 1840. And they said, we cannot allow Egypt to reestablish this Islamic dynasty and continue to bring warfare against this as has been brought and brought against this for the last 391 years. And they're going to intercede into this um, situation and end it, which they did. And when they did, on August 11th, 1840, the time prophecy was fulfilled. But nevertheless, prior to August 11th, 1840, there was distress of nations going on in the world, and that distress of nations was being accomplished by Egypt. By the way, it is worthwhile to take note that Egypt at that time period 
had the power, it had the money, it had the ability to carry on the war, but it did not have the foot soldiers. It needed actual men to fill an army, and it didn't have that. So it formed an alliance with a very new religious sect in Saudi Arabia. They agreed by treaty to be the warriors of Egypt as they carried out first the conquering of Turkey to establish a new Islamic dynasty and then to carry on the warfare. Anyone know what that new religious sect was called? Wahhabism. The birth of Wahhabism. And of course Wahhabism is the religion of Ben Laden. Ben Laden, however you want to pronounce it. And Wahhabism was restrained on August 11th, 1840. All right, so there's, there's a lot of history that's just um, important here to take note of. In any case, Jamal is going to show you at some point in time here before we get out of here, Lord willing, that Luke 21 is an illustration of the Millerite history and an illustration of the history of the 144,000 because the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter. And in the Millerite history, one of the signs of that history was the distress of nations. And we're saying that in the history of the 144,000, a parallel to that is the angering of the nations, the distress of nations, the troublous time in which the streets and walls will be built. We have already read this quote today, underneath the distress of nations, that that which follows um, the first and second angel's message is to run parallel with it. We should all, remember early on I told you, as we put these timelines together, by the time we got done, you would, you would know how to do them. This is probably almost bothering you that I'm coming up here um, still doing these now, because we all know them, and you're thinking, I don't want to write this down because I have this little pattern written down over and over again already in my notes, all right? But that which follows the first and second angel's message, and the second angel's message ended on October 22nd, 1844, that which follows the first and second angel's message is to run parallel with it. Okay, so we've already went through this quite a few times. 1798, increase of knowledge. 1833, or, and I don't, I'm not dogmatic about this, but at some point the Lord raises up William Miller to formalize the message of the hour. And this message goes through history until on August 11th, 1840, the message is in power when the mighty angel comes down out of heaven. And at this point, the testing process begins. Then in 1842, June, the Protestant churches Blunt the test, and in 1844, the third angel's message arrives in history. Early on, I pointed out that this message goes through history for a time until it is in power, and that the second angel's message goes through history for a time until it's in power. The second angel's message is empowered here at the midnight cry in August of 1844. But that which follows the first and second angel's message is to run parallel with it. The third angel's message begins to go through history here. And when we're going to run parallel with it, this is the third angel's message that began back in 1844. It's moving through history. And what we're saying is, is that on September 11th, 2001, that the third angel's message was in power when the fourth angel came down out of heaven, paralleling when the angel of Revelation 10 came down out of heaven. And we're now going to consider the similar characteristics between this history and this history. Okay? Um, what? Tuesday. Amen. Well, so we can... What we're saying is that 1989, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the fulfillment of Daniel 11, verse 40, a prophecy had been fulfilled that marked the time of the end for Adventism at the end of the world, and there began to be an increase of knowledge. In 1996, there was a publication that is in several languages around the world. Today, I don't even know how many languages, called the time of the end, that identifies the last six verses of Daniel 11, which is the formulation of the message here. Everything you've been hearing here so far is built upon the sequence of events that are set forth in the last six verses of Daniel 11. 
This here um, is what we're dealing with, September 11, 2001. Um, you see the descending power, we're talking about the descending power of Revelation 10 here, and then the descending power of Revelation 18 here. We know, brothers and sisters, that when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down, that we have reached the time period where Revelation 7, verse 1 through 3, comes into play. Let's read that, put that in our mind, and then I'm going to try to put a challenge in your mind. Um, Revelation 7, verses 1 through 3, and I'm going to ask a trick question here, by the way. Uh, by the way. So those of you that have heard this trick question are not allowed to respond one way or another, all right? But let's read Revelation 7, verse 1 through 3. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four wings of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the seas, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of, God, of our God in their foreheads. Here's the challenge I want to put forth to you. To me, as a student of prophecy, it seems absolutely and totally unreasonable to read those three verses and not ask yourself, what's the connection with Revelation 9, verse 4? Let's read Revelation 9, verse 4. It says, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Amen. Now, we may not understand what the connection is, but as a student of prophecy, the verbiage in these two areas, in Revelation 7, 1 through 3, and Revelation 9, 4, demands that we try to bring them together somehow. They're, God is not the author of confusion. He's not going to use these type of expressions without having some kind of connection to each other. So many in Adventism will think that Revelation 7, verses 1 through 3 has no connection with verse 4 of Revelation 9. And it does, and I don't think there's any excuse for saying that it doesn't. The verbiage is too close. I hope you see what I mean. The command, the, the hurt not the trees, and then the ceiling that is there to strike. That's the challenge. The question is, in verses 1 through 3 of Revelation 7, and I hope we understand that it is correct established understanding in Adventism that when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down, we have always understood that at that point, the four winds begin to hold back the four winds. The four angels begin begin to hold back the four winds while the sealing of the 144,000 takes place. This is standard understanding in Adventism. So in verses 1 through 3 of Revelation 7, where do we see the where do we see the horse? Which verse? Pardon me? Perhaps in verses one through three of Revelation seven, which of those verses do we see the horse? Perhaps in your Arabian Bible. There is no horse, brothers and sisters. There is no horses on verses 1 through 3, all right? Okay. Um, if you you turn forward um, to page 115 of your notes, in the center of the page it says the four winds. We, in Revelation 7, verses 1 through 3, we see four angels holding four winds. The winds of strife. And the reason they're being held is because at this time, God's people are going to be sealed. And in the center of page 115, it says, angels are holding the four winds, represented as an angry horse seeking to break loose and rush over the face of the whole earth, bearing destruction and death in its path. The four winds that are restrained in Revelation 7, verses 1 through 3, while God's people are sealed, are represented as an angry horse. And brothers and sisters, the angry horse of Bible prophecy has been identified 
on these two charts, which Sister White has said are ordained of the Lord, and the angry horse of Bible prophecy is Islam, and the angry horse of Bible prophecy is the four winds that are restrained when God's people are being seated. And what we're saying is that on 2001, the President of the United States went to the United Nations and said, we're now in a worldwide war with Islam, and either for us or against us, and he immediately went into Afghanistan and Iraq and set up a, a communications gathering. <laughs> They've been restrained, all right. They've been restrained. Islam was restrained here. The four winds were held back here, just as Islam was restrained by the four <coughs> European powers on August 11, 2001. To understand this, to understand this, you have to accept the pioneer understanding of the trumpets. I mean, I suppose you can understand it without accepting it. But as Seventh-day Adventists, you are required to understand the fourth angel's message in connection with the foundations of Adventism. Therefore, as a Seventh-day Adventist, you have to understand this in connection with the pioneer understanding of the prophets. And they understood that Islam was the angry course that bore death and destruction. That's what she says in its path. And brothers and sisters, look at Revelation 9, verse 11. Verse 11 of Revelation 9 is the history of the first woe. And it says they had a king over them. And William Miller says the king in Revelation 9 was Muhammad. But there's no way that Muhammad lived from the 6th century until 1449. And I'm not disagreeing with William Miller. I don't have a problem identifying Muhammad as the king, the symbol of Islam. But the, the Apollyon and Baden um, of the Old and New Testament is Satan. He's the one that brings death and destruction. But I do want you to take note that in a secondary sense, this is Islam, this is a Muhammad, this is the Quran, and a bad man, the Pollyon, means destroyer, death, destruction. And we find this in verse 11 of chapter 9. On 9 11, the angry horse of Islam that was to bear death and destruction was restrained. And on 9 11, the quote that we read about September 11th, with the great powers coming down, it's on your next page, page 114. <coughs> I, I want to tell you something, but I hope it's just sealing up. I hope it's not just stupidity, but knowing myself, it could be stupidity, all right? There's a sister here. We have a monthly newsletter that we send out on prophetic issues. And uh, when I came across this quote just a couple of months ago, I thought, wow, this is really good. Right. After the last presentation that I did, the sister came up and she says, you know, I found that quote in May of 2007, and I emailed it to you and asked for your comments, and you put it in your newsletter, and you commented on it, and you should read my comments. I don't see how this means anything, sort of like that. So, I know i have seen that quote in 2007, and it didn't, it didn't click for me at all. That sister who's here in this room, she saw it in 2007. She was excited, and I, thought I actually took some wind out of her so with my comment. You should hear this. I don't know what she was doing, but I know I took some wind out of, wind out of herself. But in this quote, in this quote, where it says um, towards the bottom, from the light given me, this is the third sentence from the bottom, I know that destruction is in the world. She's emphasizing destruction. Uh, yeah, on 114, in the center of the page, the quote from Review and Herald, July 5th, 1906, under the great buildings there will be thrown, thrown down. The third sentence from the bottom, this, this is where the buildings of New York City are thrown down in Revelation 18, verses 1 through 3, will, will be revealed. Fulfilled. She's emphasizing the destruction. This is one of the characteristics of Revelation 9, verse 11, of Apollyon and Baden, is destruction. And when Sister White says the four winds are the angry horse seeking to bring death and destruction upon the whole earth, this is the role of Islam. 
Right? This word, destruction, destroyer, this is the work of angering of the nation. So if we go back now to um, page 113, I've, I've made that point. Let's try to make another point. On the top of page 114, we've read it a couple times, we've talked about it several times. Um, on 1840, what we have is the fulfillment of the 391 year, 15 day time prophecy. Okay? And if we were going to be, you know, correct proportionately, I would start this time prophecy out of here. Everyone look up here for a second. Yeah, I would be over here, and I mean, we'd be marking here, July 27th, 1449, begins this time prophecy, 391 years and 15 days, and it comes to a conclusion right there, correct? Correct? Okay, so let's go to verse 14 and 15 of Revelation 9. It says, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates, and the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month hour and a day and a month of the year for to slay a third part of men. Over here, on July 27th, 1449, prophetically, you have four angels that are loose. Is that not what it says? They're loose for 391 years and 15 days. And brothers and sisters, the correct standard pioneer understanding is that those four angels represent the four powerful sultans of Islam. Do you understand that? Say amen. amen. Okay. So those four angels represent Islam. Amen? amen? And over here in 1449, they were loosed. Correct? So on August 11th, 1840, those four angels were restrained. Okay. The prophecies ended. They're restrained prophetically. But what I want you to see is that this day, at this point in time, you have four angels that represent Islam that are being restrained. And we're saying that on September 11, 2001, in agreement with Revelation 7, verses 1 through 3, that at this point in time, four angels restrained the four winds, which Sister White clearly lets us know is the angry horse of Islam. Once again, we're seeing four angels involved with the restraining of Islam at 2001, perfectly parallel the restraining of the four angels of Islam on August 11, 1840. Just out of curiosity, let me ask you a question. How many accidents are there in the Word of God? Every word of God. Notice under, on the bottom of page 113, it says four winds restraint. Now, Sister White, here in early writing, she's commenting on a, a statement she made earlier in the book, all right, about just making a distinction between what we call the little time of trouble. She never called the little time of trouble the little time of trouble. It's an Adventist term, but it's a good term. The little time of trouble is identifying the time of trouble that begins at the Sunday law in the United States and continues until human probation closes. When human probation closes, then you have the great time of trouble. And Sister White used the phrase time of trouble earlier on in early writings, and she wanted to make sure that her readers didn't misunderstand what she was saying. She wanted them to not think that the history she had dealt with was after probation closes. So she's making a comment on a previous statement, and she says this. This view was given in 1847 when there were but, were but very few of the Advent brethren observing the Sabbath. And of these, but few suppose that its observance was of sufficient importance to draw a line between the people of God and unbelievers. Now the fulfillment of that view is beginning to be seen. The commencement of that time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plague shall begin to be poured out, but to a short period just before they are poured out, while Christ is in the sanctuary. You follow what I mean? She's talking about the history just before Michael stands up. Now notice what she said. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth, upon the earth. The nations will be angry. 
yet held in check. She's saying that the angering of the nations arrives, but it's also held in check. And what we're saying is, is that on 2011, the angering of the nations arrived, but it was immediately held in check by George Bush and the United Nations. 2001. Okay. 2001. 2001. What did I say? Yeah. <laughs> At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming up on earth. The nations will be angry, yet held in check so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. And then here is the most important part of this passage. At that time, when the nations are held in check, the angry nations are held in check. At that time, the latter rain or refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come to give power to the loud voice of the third angel. The latter rain begins to sprinkle. I hear. And brothers and sisters, in Adventism, we have no right to think that the latter rain only begins to fall when the Sunday law arrives. You cannot answer the places where Sister White has the statements, and it's not just the one in Testimonies to Ministers 300. There are several, but the one in Testimonies to Ministers 300 we're familiar with generally in Adventism. The latter rain may, may be falling on hearts all around them, but they will not receive or recognize it, discern or recognize it. You don't want to miss the date of the document from 1947, and that third angel voice began three years prior. And the meeting with the voice of the fourth angel on uh, in the year 2001. The third angel has been, like you said, progressing through history. Testimonies and ministers, page 300. There's a time period in Adventism when the latter rain is falling, and the wheat in Adventism are receiving it. And the tares in Adventism don't even recognize that it's falling and they're not receiving it. We are required to recognize when it's falling. And brothers and sisters, the way that we recognize it is because the illustration of the outpouring of the latter rain took place in the history of 1840 to 1844. That's why Sister White says a great controversy. She says, the mighty angel that comes down and unites with the third angel on page 611 is a wonderful manifestation of the power of God, and she compares it to the Advent movement of 1840 to 1844, and in the next paragraph she says it will be similar to Pentecost. Is Pentecost an illustration of the outpouring of the Spirit? If we're to recognize the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we recognize it by recognizing that the histories that illustrate the outpouring of the latter rain have identified that that history is now repeated. And that's why the latter rain message is conveyed by bringing line upon line, here a little, there a little. Brothers and sisters, when the angry nations become angry but are restrained, the latter rain begins to fall. And at that point in time, the four winds, which are the angry horse, are restrained. And at that point in time, the great buildings of New York City are coming down. Amen. This is James White, next page, go to check. This, this being the period of the, for the fulfillment of the words of the prophet, and the nations were angry, we may reasonably expect that not only the nations of Europe will make great preparations for war, and even advance to battle, but that our own nation and all the nations of the earth may become unsettled and angry. But at the same time, the four angels will hold the four winds in check, so that the great slaughter will be prevented till the servants of God shall be sealed. Brothers and sisters, what we're teaching here is in direct agreement with pioneer understanding. You know what Sister White says about James White? 
that he fulfilled the position of Moses to the Advent people in terms of Bible doctrine. Did you know that he said that? Moses, in terms of Bible doctrine, that's who James White is. And James White is giving an understanding of the angry of the nations that is in perfect harmony with what we're doing. James White. I was just reading from James White there. Page, on the top of page 114, that is not a spirit of prophecy, but that is James White. You know, the sister that, that caught me today, and you know, I, I sent you an email with this quote back in 2007, and it went right over your head. Um, but when I came across this quote, it finally turned on. I sent it to all kinds of people, and this one brother, he was in a couple of days, it was in Arkansas, the really nice brother. Um, he, he came to me and he says, you know, when you sent me that, that quote, this quote here that's in the page, in the middle of page 114 about the great buildings of New York City being thrown down. He went to the Review and Herald article and looked it up and read it right out of the Review and Herald article. And he said he had it circled and he had it dated. And he, he had noticed it and dated it shortly after September 11, 2001. He says, I saw it immediately thereafter, but I just didn't know. I knew it meant something, but I didn't know what it meant. Just didn't fit in. He forgot all about it until you know, a few weeks ago when he went back and looked in and then see. No, we have to say that. Pardon me? When we had the study there, we brought it out. You got these books real. Okay. I'm just going to correct you twice in one of the covers. That's okay. <laughs> anyway, it's the same, the same intent. There's been several of us that have read, I know that I've read it because this quote is also in Life Sketches, all right? And I've read Life Sketches, so I know that I've read it before, other than when you sent it to me. It just, whatever, took a certain point. So let's read it together one more time. <clears throat> now comes the word that I have declared that New York is to be swept away by a tidal wave. This I have never said. I have said as I looked at the great buildings going up there story after story. What terrible scenes will take place when the Lord shall arise to shake terribly the earth. Then the words of Revelation 18 verses 1 through 3 will be fulfilled. The whole chapter, the whole of the 18th chapter of Revelation is a warning of what is coming on the earth. But I have no light in particular in regard to what is coming on New York. Only I know that one day the great buildings there will be thrown down by the turning and overturning of God's power. From the light given me, I know that destruction is in the world. One word from the Lord, one touch of his mighty power, and these massive structures will fall. Scenes will take place, the fearfulness of which we cannot imagine. Do you remember the testimonies that was coming out of New York City and the United States and the world immediately after September 11, 2001? Everyone was afraid, but we forgot. Now we're worried about the economic problem, but we've forgotten the fear. We've even forgotten that since that time, there was a tidal wave that just in a moment's time wiped out thousands and thousands of people. Yeah. Yeah. Human beings are very capable of learning how to cope with anything. You see the stories of the people that went through the, the concentration camps in Nazi Germany and other similar things, and you learn how to get by. Jesus allowed us when he created us, gave us the ability to cope with anything. It's part of what he put into our existence. And unfortunately, it can work against us. When things happen that are, the Holy Spirit uses is wanting to use to awaken us to the signs of the times and our need of preparation, we have the ability as human beings to sweep it under the rug and, and forget what, what really happened. And brothers and sisters, think back in your heart. What happened in your experience when you heard what happened on September 11, 2001, without even knowing the connection to prophecy? Did you almost go through that phrase and know we're going to go through it and have to have to say that? Some do. I'm not prepared to, but I, I know your point. Okay, um.
So what we're saying is this. Let's, let's bring this to a conclusion. This is the Millerite history that's going to be fulfilled again to the very letter because the Millerite history was the fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins and Sister Wright says the parable of the ten virgins is going to be fulfilled again to the very letter. This is the, the history of the seven thunders. It's the events that transpired under the first and second angel's message but the seven thunders also represent future events that will be disclosed in their order, she said. This is the fulfillment of the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. This is the repetition of Revelation 14. This is the reform movement of the Millerites. This is the reform movement of the 144,000. There are other arguments to emphasize that this history is repeated. This history here begins at the time of the end, as identified in Daniel 11, verse 40. This history here begins at the time of the end, as identified in Daniel 11, verse 40. This message here was in power from one of the woe trumpets in the book of Revelation. This message here is empowered from one of the world trumpets in the book of Revelation. This is empowered when Islam is restrained by the four great European powers. This empowerment takes place when the entire world restrains Islam once again. At this point, the four angels representing Islam are restrained. They have been loosed at the beginning of the time prophecy. They are now restrained. Here, the four winds are restrained by the four angels, but the four winds represent the angry horse of Islam. This was a worldwide event. Great controversy. Six of us. First angel's message carried every mission station in the world. This event was worldwide. The next way mark in this history was when the Protestants of the USA closed the door of their probation against the message of the hour. The next event in this history is when the Protestants of the USA closed the, their door against the message of the hour. Following this, we have the midnight cry. Following this, we have the specific marking of the loud cry. Following this, we have the beginning of judgment, and this concludes with the close of judgment. 1842, June of 1842, in Testimony, Volume 1, page 21, Sister White said that in June of 1842, Mr. Miller gave his second course of lectures at the Castro Street Church in Portland, and then towards the bottom of the paragraph, she said, with few exceptions, the Protestant denominations closed their doors against Mr. Miller's message. Protestants closed their door. Protestants closed their door. Worldwide local, worldwide local, midnight cry, loud cry, beginning judgment, end judgment. Angel comes down with the restraining of Islam. Angel comes down with the restraining of Islam. <clears throat> Every reform movement's the same. The first step convicts of sin. Miller's message convicted of sin. In the second message, righteousness was manifested in the midnight cry, and it leads to judgment. The work of the Holy Spirit is to convince of sin and righteousness and judgment. This message, brothers and sisters, if you believe this message is true, that the latter reign, that the judgment of the living is now underway, it's a conviction of sin. It follows by the next way mark where righteousness the righteousness of Christ is manifested to the world in the greatest crisis of all time. Amen. And it ends when judgment closes. You want to add one more argument to this? The majority of Seventh-day Adventists at every sector of Adventism, whether it's the General Conference Brethren, and they've heard about this, or the self-supporting ministries and conservative Adventism, and they've heard about this. Or the conference churches that have heard about it. And the majority of the lay people that have heard about it, they reject it. Without even investigating it. Oh, uh, I'm only saying that. I'm not I'm only saying that because that is one of the components of the latter end message. It's a, it's a refusal to even consider the message because I have preconceived ideas on how the latter rain comes and what the latter rain is, and I'm not even going to listen to that foolishness, especially if that foolishness is being brought 
by someone with stammering lips. At least the Pharisees sent out somebody to investigate. Others always spies. There's <laughs> <laughs> always spies. If you're not investigating, they're spying. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we've been asking that you would pour your light and rain out upon us, and we ask at this time that you would continue to do so, but that as you convey the light and rain to us through the unfolding of your prophetic word, 